Hi everyone, and welcome to our pre-course lectures for the AAP Resident Fellow Medical Student Bootcamp. For those who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Suhu, and I'm one of the sports attendings at Wall Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian, as well as the Associate Sports Fellowship Program Director here. Today's lecture will be a quick lecture on introduction to musculoskeletal ultrasound to hopefully help prep you guys for our boot camp in person in New Orleans. All right, I have no financial disclosures. I uh, just want to acknowledge Dr. Nate Olson for help with the majority of these slides. All right, so what is musculoskeletal ultrasound? So musculoskeletal ultrasound has become a mainstay in a lot of our current practices and uses high frequency sound waves to help diagnose soft tissue and bone pathology, as well as help guide interventions. How does ultrasound work? So it works by using the piezoelectric effect. So what happens is um, in the probe, you have crystals that are located uh, at the very tip of the transducer and is usually agitated by electrical current, which leads to production of an ultrasonic wave, which is transmitted into the tissue via coupling gel. These same crystals then serve as receivers of these ultrasonic waves that bounce back and uh, from the tissue and are absorbed by the transducer crystals and generate specific electrical signals that are then processed into an image that we then see on our screen. This is an example of an image that we would see by um, this type of effect. So there are a lot of different terminology to describe how these ultrasonic waves uh, act and move through soft tissue. Uh, first is reflection. So it occurs at interface of different tissues. So the greater the difference in acoustic impedance between the two tissues, the greater the reflection. Uh, next is transmission. So um, the waves moving through the tissue. Three is attenuation. So with increasing depth, the waves tend to weaken. And then last is refraction, where the waves can change direction. Uh, all of these can combine to give the image that we then see on the screen. So what is the scope of musculoskeletal ultrasound? So the advantages of using musculoskeletal ultrasound is that it um, has no ionizing radiation, so very safe for all of our patients. It's dynamic, so it can give us good real-time imaging of, of, of what is going on it's interactive. You um, can do comparisons bilaterally. So if you wanna see what one side looks at versus the other, that can be really helpful to identify uh, pathology. It's less expensive than, for example, MRIs. It's very portable, so you can take it between clinic rooms, but you can also uh, have portable ultrasounds that you can then take on the sideline of a field during sports coverage. It is very high diagnostic value, uh, and then it can be very helpful with needle guidance. The disadvantages are that it is very operator dependent, so the skill level of the person using the ultrasound um, is really important uh, when diagnosing things. It cannot penetrate through bone, so looking into a joint makes it uh, is very difficult. Uh, it has inability to completely image certain structures. And then the resolution decreases with increased depth. So the further away something is or deeper it is, sometimes it can be really hard to make it out. Uh, well, um, if it's too far down. Next, I'm going to go through some terminology on how to best get the optimal image. So first and foremost, you want to make sure you're holding the probe correctly. As you can see uh, on the picture on the left here, um, this is a common way that a lot of people like to try to hold the probe to avoid getting gel on their hands. But the actual best way is similar to the uh, picture on the right side, was we really want to anchor your hand on the patient, which does mean that your, your hand will, uh, will become full of gel. Uh, you want to grasp the probe low and holding it in your first web space, and you want to make sure your fifth finger or, 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 the, or your hand is uh, on the patient, and this is called a full contact sport. The other common terminology that people like to describe this is, is milking a cow. Uh, next, we'll go over heel toe. So um, heel toe is basically when you are looking at, most commonly looking at a structure in long axis, so holding it parallel to the structure and rocking or angling um, the transducer along the long axis. 
as you can see here, and this is very helpful uh, and helps eliminate anisotropy. Next uh, is toggle and wag. So for this one, the transducer is angled from side to side, usually looking um, at the structure in short axis um, or perpendicular to long axis of the image structure. And this can help identify tendon well and also help eliminate anisotropy. Next is translation. The transducer is moved to a new location while maintaining a perpendicular angle with the skin surface, as you can see here. Next is sweep. So the transducer is slid from side to side while maintaining a stable hand position similar to sweeping a broom. All right, and now we're go we'll go into um, some of the specific ultrasound features um, to help optimize your image as well. So first we'll go over is frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the resolution and less, less depth penetration. So usually this is best for superficial structures. So um, the highest frequency probe that we have is the hockey stick and is really helpful for looking at more superficial structures, um, usually um, hand wrist, uh, you know, um, that, those type of things. Uh, lower frequency um, usually has lower resolution, but has more depth and penetration. So usually best for deeper structures. So um, our lowest frequency probe is usually the curve and linear probe and usually um, best for looking at kind of the hip um, or the um, posterior uh, uh, hip. Uh, the most common probe that we use for the majority of uh, musculoskeletal applications is a linear probe, which is um, higher frequency than the curvilinear probe, but lower frequency than the hockey stick. Next, um, we'll go over depth. So that is something that you can control on the ultrasound machine. Uh, it's best to make sure you can visualize the, the whole structure you're looking at and it takes up the entire screen. As you can see here on the left side of the screen, you um, the structure you're looking at is only taking up about one third of the screen, and that's not what we want. We want to uh, then decrease the depth so that the structure takes up the whole screen. Uh, next, we'll go over focal zones. So focal zones um, is narrowing of the ultrasound wave beam, um, which helps increase resolution. So focal zone is where the beam is the narrowest and you wanna make sure you place the focal zone near the area of interest. As you can see in this top picture, you have a quite large focal zone. So then when you narrow the focal zones, as you can see here by these arrows, it can help uh, increase the resolution slightly. Next is gain. So gain um, is basically the brightness and darkness of the display. If you increase the gain, it makes things brighter and vice versa. It can uh, often help compensate for attenuation with increased depth. Uh, and then you want to make sure you optimize the gain for the desired structure. As you can see here, um, this has lower gain. And when we increase it, you can kind of see that it can help bring out um, some of, uh, uh, you know, those are different additional features of this image. So overall, for image optimization, the goal is to maximize resolution and clarity. You want to make sure you hold the probe properly, select the proper transducer and frequency, adjust depth until the structure of interest is visible and centered in the image, adjust the focal zone to help with resolution, and adjust the gain. So now we'll go over some common artifacts we uh, frequently encounter with ultrasound to make sure you're familiar with them as you scan. I'll go through each of these in more detail in the ensuing slides. So first and foremost is anisotropy, which is the most common artifact we see and have to worry about. Anisotropy is encountered usually when the structure is not uh, that we're looking at is not image perpendicular to the sound beam. Uh, this makes um, the structure appear artifactually hypoechoic, which may simulate pathology. And we frequently see this in tendon, ligament, and muscle. As you can see in this table here, um, looking at which of these structures are most susceptible to anisotropy, and most often it is a tendon followed by ligament, uh, followed by nerve and muscle. This is, this is an example of what anisotropy looks like. 
um, as you can see here on the left side of the screen, uh, there, this is an ultrasound image of a supraspinatus tendon, uh, and commonly um, you'll kind of see this hyp more hypoechoic spot of um, the tendon that some people may uh, falsely call a tear. However, that's because the sound beams aren't exactly uh, perpendicular to it. And so if you kind of adjust the probe slightly, you're able to then fill, fill this in, uh, and then you uh, know for sure that this is not pathology and is and is more coming from ionosotropy. Next is shadowing. This occurs when the ultrasound beam is reflected, absorbed, or refracted. Uh, the resulting image shows an anechoic area that extends deep from the involved interface. Usually we see this um, when ultrasounding um, bone or calcification, foreign body or gas. As you can see here, there's a calcification that's hyperechoic. Um, uh, sitting in this structure, and so then everything underneath it um, looks very anechoic. So you, you won't be able to call pathology at anything underneath the structure as um, those ultrasound beams are unable to penetrate. Next is increase through transmission, also called posterior acoustic enhancement. This occurs during imaging of fluid and soft, solid soft tissue tumors. Uh, the sound beam is relatively less attenuated compared with the adjacent tissues. Therefore, the deeper soft tissues will appear relatively hyperechoic, as you can see here. Um, when imaging this um, fluid-like structure, you can see some, um, some increased uh, hyperechogenicity um, um, below that. Next is reverberation. Um, this occurs when um, the, the surface of the object is smooth and flat. Most commonly we see this um, with needle, and this um, happens because the sound beam reflects back and forth between the smooth surface and transducer and produces a series of linear reflective echoes that extend deep into the structure, as you can see here um, in this picture. Refraction is when the ultrasound beam travels through an area with strong impedance. The delayed return of the ultrasound signals to the transducer leads to an overestimation of the depth of the objects. This usually occurs between substances such as fat and muscle. As you can see here, instead of kind of coming all the way across, it, if you go through this substance, it looks like it's deeper um, than it actually is. Echogenicity, um, which is our next topic, is a really important topic to understand when describing ultrasound imaging. Uh, next, we'll jump into how to best describe the common structures we see based on echogenicity. So echogenicity is basically the ability to reflect or transmit ultrasound waves in the context of surrounding tissues. Hyperechoic hyper equals more, so that's usually white on the screen. Isoechoic is equal. Hypoechoic is less, so that's usually gray on the screen and anechoic is none and is usually black on the screen. So muscle is usually described um, with as a hypoechoic water-rich background corresponding to muscle fascicles along with linear hyperechoic strands um, related to the fi fibroadipose septa. So in long axis, um, it, this looks more like a pennate or feather-like structure as you can see here um, in figure B and short axis to a muscle looks more like starry sky, as you can see here in figure A. Tendon is um, in long axis, uh, as you can see here in figure A, um, described as a fibular pattern. Uh, so it's basically a succession of fine hyperechoic lines alternating with hypoechoic lines in orderly uh, parallel arrangement. And then short axis, also called pepper and salt, um, is a mass of hyperechoic granules alternating with hypoechoic granules of the same size, evenly distributed. Bone is described as hyperechoic, as you can see here, it shows it, turn, it looks bright white um, uh, on the screen. Nerve, so uh, in long axis, um, it has a fascicular pattern and it appears as parallel elongated hypoechoic channels of variable thickness surrounded by hyperechoic lines of the perineurium and is usually less orderly than a tendon, as you can see here. In short axis, um, it is described as honeycomb and is usually a grouping of round or oval hypoechoic points of various sizes, as you can see here. 
Ligament um, is easier to evaluate in uh, the long axis or longitudinal uh, rather than the short axis plane. Um, it also has a little bit of a fibular pattern, but it's less bright and less orderly than um, uh, a tendon. It's very easy to distinguish from a tendon as it connects bone to bone, whereas um, tendon connects muscle to bone. Fluid is considered anechoic or hypoechoic, as you can see here. And then vasculature usually runs alongside nerves. It is um, anechoic because it has fluid in it. Uh, veins usually have thinner walls and are larger and more collapsible under pressure from the probe, while as arteries are usually round, pulsatile, and less compressible. You can also then put the power doppler on and it helps you better distinguish what is artery um, which is here, um, versus vein, which is here. So summary, you want to make sure you optimize the image and set yourself up for success, focusing on the depth, focal zone, gain, and the uh, uh, most accurate probe. Um, scanning technique, you want to make sure you stabilize the transducer on the patient with your hand. Make sure you move the transducer a small amount at a time and, be, and beware of anisotropy. Practice, practice, practice this is the name of the game to help make you um, the best as uh, possible you can be with ultrasound. And this is also something that you'll be able to do at our boot camp in New Orleans. And looking forward to seeing you all there. Here are my references. Thank you guys very much and see you guys soon.